Well, welcome everyone. Really pleased to see you all um, uh, sort of face to face for this. Really exciting uh, bit of work um, where we are asking you to be able to deal with a skin tear, something that I suspect most of you will have seen, um, to apply um, a first aid dressing to the skin tear. There is a time uh, uh, element to this of needing to get them dealt with um, as soon as possible to improve the outcomes. Um, and um, I think you probably all know that when you try and get a district nurse to come and see one of your patients, it may be some considerable time before they get there. So if you can do the right first aid, we can get much better outcomes for our patients. And that's what this is all about, really. So we're trying to educate you and to introduce this pathway to help uh, improve the management of skin tears. But also we want to teach you how to try and reduce the number of skin tears that are out there. Um, so the objectives today are to get you guys to be able to describe skin tears. Um, we're going to show you some pictures. We're going to give you some definitions. Um, I'm going to explain those um, so that you'll be able to do that. We want you to be able to understand those uh, people who are at high risk of skin tears, how you can prevent them. And we're going to think about what impact it has on both the patient and the organisation. So what is a skin tear? I suspect most of you have seen one. They're extremely common, um, particularly in care homes um, because of the types of people that you, you are looking after. So it's called, um, it's a traumatic wound. It's caused by mechanical forces. So it just doesn't happen overnight, like when you've got a, a dermatous leg and it starts to weep. Something happens, there's some sort of assault or injury, some sort of mechanical force um, that um, causes a partial or complete separation of the outer skin layers from the inner tissue. So basically, if you think of the skin, you know, as as one layer, it's like you're peeling it back. That is a skin tear. So it's not a wound that goes deep into the tissues. It's just the, the, the top layer becomes separated from the tissues underneath, which are undamaged. So where do we mainly get these? So they can be on any part of the body, but by far the most common places are your arms and legs. Um, and most of them, 78, 70 or 80 percent of them occur on the hands or the arms, but can also be on on lower legs. And what are the common causes? So we've already said it's usually something mechanical. So um, one of the um, uh, key things that can cause a skin tear that people don't sort of think about necessarily is what's called shearing forces um, and friction. Um, now, I don't know if you know what that means, but imagine, I don't know, did you ever ha as a child do something called a Chinese burn where you you got hold of your brother or your sister's arm and you twisted the skin so that the skin went one arm, one direction in one hand and then the other. And you're basically pulling the, the tissues apart. Well, that's sort of shearing forces. It's sort of dragging the skin um, uh, away from the tissues underneath. Um, and that's called shearing. Um, and that can happen in manual handling if you're not careful. Blunt trauma. So if somebody dropped something, say they dropped a, a mug onto their leg, that blunt trauma could cause a skin tear. A fall could do that. As I said, poor handling. So if you've got somebody with very fragile skin on their arms and you try to hold onto their arm and pull them to standing, that shearing force, that poor handling technique could cause a rip in the skin. Um, it could be caused by equipment, um, by a hoist sling, for example, and it can be caused by removal of dressings. If you're doing the business of I'll just rip it off in one quick removal, that'll be kinder and you've got somebody with fragile skin, you could end up ripping the skin. And some people are more at risk of others. Um, so these typically are the elderly, and that's really because as we get older, our skin changes. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're healthy or not healthy, just the aging process, um, your skin begins to deteriorate, becomes more fragile um, and is more vulnerable to damage, particularly skin tears, um, where it would take a lot of force to pull, the, to rip my skin. It could take a lot less force for somebody 
who is older. So older people at much greater risk and people who are requiring assistance in their activities of daily living. So if you're having to help somebody to stand up, get dressed in and out of the bath, that increases the risk. People who've got dry or thin skin, so the tissue paper skin that we've already mentioned. Um, you can tell some people, and I expect you all know your residents that are at risk of skin tears, um, and you can usually tell because you see on their skin these sort of white scars, and they're, they're often moon-shaped, sort of crescent-shaped scars, where they've had a skin tear before that's healed. So people have had them before, more risk of getting them again. And when somebody's acutely unwell, um, that puts them at greater risk as well. So if somebody's um, dehydrated, for example, the skin is drier and more liable to rip. If somebody's got an infection and a temperature, the skin is hotter and maybe more moist and sweaty, and that may um, be a, a greater risk of damage. And then if somebody is confused or aggressive and is flinging their arms around, um, they're, they're at risk of, of knocking themselves on something. Um, uh, yes, and, 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 and causing a skin tear. So you can see by those descriptors that actually describes probably the majority of the people that you're looking after. And that's why we're doing this piece of work specifically with you guys. We have taught the district nurses about this, but it's really you guys um, that we are rolling this work out to because you are there at the time with the people at most risk. And if we can get you to do the right thing um, in that moment, um, we can have much better outcomes. So why are we bothered about skin tears? Yes, it's a wound, but you know, what's the big deal? Well, obviously, to start with, things like this can be very painful, not just in the trauma that, that causes it, but then the ongoing problems. If the skin tear isn't well managed to start with, it can turn into a chronic wound, and that can be very painful and distressing, particularly if you've got somebody and it happens on their shin, and they've already got poor circulation and wounds are difficult to heal in that area, that then could turn into a leg ulcer. So pain and distress for the patient is the most important thing, and that can have a significant impact on their quality of life. Um, also, something that's there, a hole in the skin, um, is a much greater risk of infection, and infections can be really serious. One, the wounds can get a lot bigger, a lot worse, but they can also get into the, the tissues and have a cellulitis, and then into the blood and to cause a sepsis. So, um, yeah, they can be a small thing to start with, but lead on to bigger things in a number of different ways. And all of that means that um, they can become really costly, costly to patients, but costly to the people that are looking after them. Um, you know, if, if a patient develops a wound on a leg from a skin tear that turns into an ulcer, you'll be seeing the district nurses coming in two or three times a week, doing lots of bandaging, all sorts of things for weeks on end, trying to get the wound healed. That takes a lot of their time, a lot of resources. So it costs the NHS, costs your services um, uh, a lot of time and money as well. And the evidence also is that, um, um, you know, um, if people get a skin tear whilst they're in hospital, um, it can lead to prolonged hospitalisation. Never good to be in hospital longer than you need to be. The risks of getting infection, but again, also costs to the patient um, and, and to the NHS. So lots of nasty um, effects and all of these can be minimised, one by preventing them and two by treating them properly as soon as they happen. So how do we prevent them? Well, to start with, you've got to know exactly what's going on with your patient. And this is something that you guys already do. You do it when you have somebody admitted to you and periodically afterwards, you do a holistic assessment. So you're looking at things like, you know, what's their mobility like? How do they move? Do they need assistance to move? What sort of equipment would they need? You will do a manual handling risk assessment. And you'll be looking at um, writing a care plan upon how to transfer somebody and what the correct way of doing it, that is. Um, you'll be thinking at the same time as yeah, are they unsteady on their feet? Are they at risk of falls? Um, and all of that will feed into identifying whether somebody's at risk of pressure damage. So you'll be looking at things as well of what aids are they using and is there any risk there? So wheelchairs, for example, those good old foot plates, they're a great thing at causing skin tears, aren't they? So um, that part of your um, uh, assessment would be identifying that. 
Another thing that you're going to be doing is examining your pet, your resident's skin. You know, you're going to be going from head to toe, front to back. You're looking to see if they've got any existing wounds, but you're also looking to see if they've got dry skin, fragile skin, sore, moist areas, any skin conditions already like psoriasis. Have they had skin tears and things in the past? So you're looking uh, and doing a skin assessment. You're going to be doing a nutritional assessment. You're going to be looking at how much they're eating and drinking. What's their weight? Have they been losing weight? Do they have a low BMI? You need to be doing a, a, a must score. So your malnutrition universal screening tool score. Um, uh, people who ha um, have got uh, poor nutritional intake um, are at much higher risk of skin tears. They don't have enough protein in and the skin and the tissues become very fragile. They've got they're not robust, really. Um, so you need to think about that. Dehydrated people, dry skin, more likely to break. Um, you need to be thinking about um, anything that um, has been stuck on the patient. So if they have any medical devices um, and making sure that, that they're not um, um, causing a risk. But also if you're using adhesives, you shouldn't be using um, harsh adhesives at all and only using them, the gentle paper tape on somebody's skin or the silicone dressing that we are um, going to um, introduce you to today. Um, using long sleeves and um, uh, trousers to protect skin. So if you have somebody that you can see they've had a number of skin tears before, part of your prevention plan would be, well, if we keep the skin covered, if something's knocked against the skin, then that reduces the risk of a skin tear. So plenty that can be done there. Um, you know, people with dry skin, you're going to be putting emollients and things on. I hope you all know that you shouldn't be using any soap on your residents. Older people's skin, um, as we've said, is much, much more vulnerable. And what soap does is one, it dries the skin out, but two, it changes the acidity on the skin. Um, skin is normally um, um, slightly acid and that is part of is a pH of something like 5.5 and that's part of its defense mechanism and soap changes that and it, it means that it reduces the defenses of the skin um, so um, all older people really you shouldn't really be using soap on their skin you should be using an emollient as a soap substitute so very often it's those big tubs of the greasy stuff so it might be hydromol um, hydromol ointment zero derm ointment or or uh, what's the latest one, Epimax ointment, any of those things, great as soap substitutes. Uh, yeah. And then people with dry skin, and that's most old, older people, should be having their skin moisturised twice a day. Um, so the, the cream emollients that you get, so the white, you know, softer creams, um, they don't last that long. Um, and in fact, in a perfect world, you'd be putting it on four times a day. But, you know, twice a day when you're getting up in the morning and going to bed, all over their skin, arms and legs to um, keep the skin nicely uh, moisturised um, will, will help. Um, and this is vital. It should be seen as a vital part of skincare in people um, with older skin. So that's all of your residents. Um, twice daily application has been proven to reduce the incidence of skin tears by 50 percent. Now, that's massive, isn't it? So if you've identified somebody at risk, their care plan needs to have application of um, uh, moisturising cream emollients twice a day on there and you've already halved their risk. So can you see what an important role you guys have to play in preventing these things? So on top of that, what we're asking you to do is to provide some first aid to the wound. So I'm just going to give you a quick, quick summary and then we'll do the sort of teaching and things afterwards. So um, if one of the carers comes running to you and says, oh, 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 quick, this person's just fallen over, they've cut their leg and it's bleeding. And you go, what we're asking you to do is to look at it, decide if it's a skin tear, classify it, and we're going to show you what to do. That's a simple thing, not to worry. And then we're asking you if it's more, if it's more than a skin tear, if it's out of your sphere of competence, and again, we're going to give you some descriptors of this, you're going to need to escalate it. So I don't know if any of you have ever seen anybody that's almost completely degloved their arm, as we call it, that there's been a skin tear, but it's like peeled the skin off the limb almost. 
clearly that is more than you can deal with and you'd need to escalate that. Um, so you will need to know when to escalate it. But then if it's a skin tear and it's within your, your sphere of competence as we're going through today, you'll be doing an emergency dressing on, on that wound. And then you're going to be referring to the district nurses who will take over looking after it from that point onwards. So this pathway that we've developed, we've also rolled out into, and this is the beginning of it, into nursing homes as well. So when you see the pathway in its fullness, and um, there is part of it that talks about assessing the wound and ongoing management of the wound, that's not going to be up to you. You will just be doing that first aid dressing. So you don't need to um, uh, look at whether you've got slough in the wound and things like that or decide when you're going to be redressing it and how you do the redressing. All you're going to be doing is that one dressing as the first aid. So this is the beginning of the pathway. And the first thing that you do is you look at this wound and you decide if it's a skin tear. Then you're going to look at it and you're going to assess it a little bit more. Um, you're going to look to see if it's bleeding and if it's bleeding, you're going to be applying some light pressure. We're going to go through this technique, don't worry. And then you're going to be cleansing the wound. So when you look at the wound to start with and we say you're going to say, right, is this a skin tear? There are three types of skin tear that you can see here um, on the um, on this sort of slide. Um, so in all of them, you can see that this is just the skin we're dealing with. It's not like you've got a big crater underneath it. It's not like you've got bones sticking out. Um, you know, there's not other, other structures there and it, it's not like a centimetre deep. It's literally the skin that has sort of come away and the underlying structures um, are generally all there. So the type one skin uh, skin tear is basically where there's been a break in the skin, but you can get the edges back together again. So you can see where my little arrow is hovering around on these top two right photographs. There, the skin is broken, but the two edges have sort of are basically aligned with each other. There's not a big gap like there is in this wound here. This little one here, it may have been that the flap was off, but when you finish dressing it, that the skin comes back together. So you've just got the little line. So that is a, a type one. There's no skin loss. Yes, it's broken, but it's not lost. So there's either a linear or flap tear, which can be repositioned to cover the wound bed. Now I'm going to do a little video to show you what we mean about that. Um, um, in just a second. So that's a type one. Type two is this next picture down here. And you can see again, it's only skin deep. You've got all of the nice pink tissues underneath. And this is what we call the skin flap here. Now, some of this skin flap, we've managed to get the edge together there. It might have been that this piece of skin, this triangle here, was all wrinkled up at this part of the wound. And that by doing the dressing, some of it has come, the margins or the edges have come together again here. But some of the flap is either lost or you can't unroll it. It may be, if you look carefully at that picture, that it's stuck underneath there. So what you've got is what we call partial flap loss, which cannot be repositioned to cover the whole of the wound bed. OK, so some of it is stuck down, but some of it is lost. So that's a type two. A type three is a total flap loss. So the skin has been ripped off, how, whatever the injury was, and it's left this area of wound that's just got no skin on top. There's no depth to it. It's just that the skin has all been removed. So that's called a total flap loss, exposing the entire wound bed. OK, so when you're looking at your wound and your care has called you, you've got your gloves on, you've cleaned up the blood, you've stopped the bleeding, you're looking at it, you're thinking, right, what have I got here? Is it just a skin tear? If it's deeper than that, you might need to be calling somebody else. If it's just a skin tear, you're going to be able to deal with this, but you need to tell the nurses when you're referring it to them, is it a type one, a type two 
or a type three. And at this point, we'd also be asking you to take a photograph of the wound. So what do you need to escalate? Now you're going to need your, to use your judgment here because if this is, you know, 11 o'clock in the morning on a Monday morning, um, um, you, um, if you refer to the district nurses, they're not going to get to you for hours. If it's four o'clock in the afternoon, they're definitely not going to get to you to the next day. So you're going to need to put something on the wound. The question is, do you need to escalate to another service for something more serious than before the district nurses come along to change the dressing? So things that you might need to escalate. Well, as I was um, describing beforehand, if you had a massive skin loss, like a what we call a degloving, where the whole of the skin on the arm has sort of been peeled back. So anything that's bigger than the largest dressing you've got, you're not going to be able to manage and you're going to need to escalate that to 111. If you started doing your first aid and you've got your gloves on and your gauze, but you, you can't stop the wound from bleeding, even with sort of, you know, firm pressure, you're going to need to escalate that. If, for example, the resident has fallen over outside and you can see there's a big bit of grit in the wound that you can't get out, you're going to need to escalate that. Um, and if you can see that there's been deeper damage than just a skin tear, that's going to need escalating. Somebody's going to need to come and see that. Um, and we do have a competency that's going to go with this and you will be I'll show you that later on. Um, but if if after having achieved that competency, you come to a wound and you think this is beyond what I have been taught to handle, then that's something that you need to escalate as well. So you've looked at your wound, you've decided if you need to escalate it, you've classified it, you've stopped your bleeding. The next thing that the pathway asks you to do is to try and replace that little skin flap. Now I'll show you a video in a second. That is not as daunting as you might think that it is. We're not asking you to perform surgery here. It's not plastic surgery you're doing. This is stuff that you would do if your kids fell over um, and injured their knee, okay? So yeah, don't be worried about that. Um, and then we're asking you to put um, a particular dressing over this wound. So this is called clinidum foam silicone border. And the reason why um, uh, this lovely gentleman is sat here uh, <laughs> um, uh, in, um, into our uh, video training this afternoon is that Pete works for the company H&R that make this dressing. And you're going to be seeing something um, of him because um, we have put together um, a first aid box for you for dealing with skin tears. And Pete is going to be the person. He's holding it up to you now. It's a big plastic box, skin tear box. Um, and in that box are going to be the dressings. There's also going to be a copy of this pathway, a copy of the guidance on how to classify the wound. There's going to be a couple of dressing packs, all the things that you would need to do the dressing. Um, OK, so this particular dressing, what the idea is when you're doing the dressing on the wound is, so if you see this picture here, what we've got here is um, potentially a type one or type two skin dare skin tear depending upon what you manage to achieve when you're doing your dressing what we'd like you to be doing is um once you've got your hands washed and your dressing pack open and the rest of it and you've got some water and gauze etc is to see if you can smooth out that piece of skin as much as possible to try and get the edges of the skin as close to the edges of the wound as you can manage now if in doing that um, you are able to do that. You would change that from a type two to a type one skin tear. If they don't quite get to the edges and you've got this area, this like this little tick or smile exposed, that would be a type two. Wherever you get to, what you'll be doing is popping this dressing on top. And the idea is that you take notice of what direction that flap is pointing in. Because this sticky dressing, when you put it on, we want you to put an arrow in the direction that you want the person who's going to remove it to pull the dressing. 
So if you put a dressing on top of this wound at the top and you peeled it from the bottom upwards, as you peeled the dressing back, you would peel the flap back. So by putting the arrow on, you're telling somebody, peel it from the top downwards in the direction of the arrow. And that then gives it far more chance that this flap will stick down and you won't remove it as the dressing is being taken off. We also want you to write the date on the dressing because ideally the dressing would be left in place for seven days. The dressing is such that it's a tacky dressing. It's not got a, a nasty adhesive product like glue underneath that will rip the skin. It's a silicone tacky dressing. And what that means is that when the district nurses come to look at the wound, they'll be able to peel it back in the direction of the arrow peek underneath and stick it back down again as long as everything's OK. And if it's OK, they'll be able to leave it on for seven days. And all of those actions maximise the chance of sticking as much of that skin down as possible and this wound healing really quickly. Without that, it could become a really chronic wound. So. What's going to happen sort of from now on? Well, after this training today and there's videos and more stuff to, to show you in a minute, the box that Pete has just been showing you there, um, he is going to be making a note of all of the uh, people that have um, uh, been here today. Um, and he will be working his way around all of your care homes um, and delivering your skin tear box, going over this again with you um, and um, so that you have your box there. You will then need to decide where you're going to keep it and communicate with all of your care leaders so that they know where the box is. Um, you will be receiving a copy of the competency, which the care home support service or the delegated health tasks nurse trainers. So that's April and Kaz and Caroline or your care home support service um, uh, uh, rep in your area. Um, they will be available to work with you on the competency and sign you off. So um, the next thing you'll be doing once you've got your box is um, uh, working on the competency um, and then getting yourself signed off. Uh, once you've got yourself signed off and you're competent, you then need to keep a record yourself, send a copy to the delegated health um, care task nurse trainers for them to keep there. Um, uh, yes, and then you're good to go. And then, of course, when you get new care leaders in, you need to point them in the direction of the competency and the videos so that they themselves can get um, trained up and get signed off by either the Care Home Support Service or one of the nurse trainers. I've got a couple of videos I'd like to show you. Stop showing this. So the first video I want to show you is, um, can I just ask before I do that, do any of you do emergency dressings already? Hands up, I can see you if you've got your, yeah, few nods, hands up, yes, okay. Um, so lots of transferable skills in all of this and possibly some of you have been doing this sort of thing um, already. Those of you that haven't, don't freak out, this is quite straightforward. Um, I'm gonna play you two videos now. Uh, one is the general way of what you need to be doing to do the, the, the dressing, washing your hands, opening your dressing pack, putting your gloves and apron and things on, on cleaning the wound, etc. So let me just share this one first. Wound dressing, practical demonstration. Before you begin, it is important to clean your work area and gather your supplies. Dressing pack, water or saline, new dressings. Wash your hands thoroughly with warm soapy water.
dry them thoroughly. Open the dressing pack fully onto a table to create a sterile surface. It is important that this area is touched as little as possible. Remove the apron from the dressing pack. Open the apron out and put it on. Take out the disposal bag. Remove the old dirty dressings and place them in the bag ready for disposal. You can use the bag itself to remove the dressings. Use the sticky strip on the disposal bag to attach it next to your work area. Open all of the dressings required and drop them onto the sterile area. Remove the plastic tray from the pack. Fill it with water or saline. Wash and dry your hands again. Remove the gloves from the pack and put them on. Try to avoid touching the outside of the gloves as much as possible. Wet the gauze pad with water or saline. Gently clean the wound. Start at the centre and dab in circles out to one inch past the edge. Don't wipe or rub too hard as this could damage the newly healing tissue. Do not go from the outer edges of the wound back toward the centre. This could spread germs into the wound. Peel the backing off the dressings. Apply the dressings to the wound. Be careful to avoid touching the wound itself. Dispose of the gloves. and apron. The dressing pack and any other waste can also be put into the disposal bag. Dispose of the waste disposal bag as advised by the nursing staff and then wash your hands. 
Don't forget, if you have any questions or concerns, please contact your district nurse or healthcare professional. You could see in that demonstration that they were just using water from the tap and that is what you're going to be doing. You don't need to be using the sterile saline here. Um, what I'm going to show you now is another little video about when they were cleaning the wound with the gauze. That is the point that we're going to ask you to see if the skin is all wrinkled up, that you would try and smooth it out and see if you can get the edges out. Now, I've done a little home video with a little help from my husband, so you'll have to excuse the armed ram, but I didn't have an arm with a skin tear on it to be able to demonstrate it properly um, to you. So I'm just going to show you what, what that action would, would look like here. Here we go. OK, so once you've got your sterile dressing pack out and you have your gloves on, you've got the tap water in your bowl and taking this sterile gauze from the dressing pack, um, you're now going to, having stopped the bleeding, you're going to try and replace the skin flap. Uh, the idea is that the curl of skin that you've got there, you want to try and smooth it out so that it fits as good as possible um, into the area of tissue that's revealed. So with your wet bit of gauze, you would be cleaning the wound, gently trying to push the skin flap back. You may need to get rid of the gauze and just use your wet finger to try and gently move the skin flap back into place so that it covers the area as much as possible um, so that you've got as, as small a wound as possible showing. And then it's at that point that you're going to cover the dressing with your silicone board of dressing and put your arrow on top. OK, so um, Pete, I don't know if anybody got to see properly because I was sharing my screen earlier on. Would you like to show them the dressing again? Hello. So this is the this is the dressing. So inside the box that Pete's going to bring will be two boxes of dressings of two different sizes, a smaller one and a slightly larger one. And this is what they look like. Um, so it says brown outer cover. It's all nice and flexible. And then on the other side, the sticky side, um, it's just like the dressing, like the soft pour dressings that you're used to, like an elastoplast. The backing just peels off on both sides and it's tacky all the way across the box bottom of the dressing. It will stick to your gloves, so just beware about that and just try and hold the edges or you can just peel the back off to stick it onto the wound. Um, it's nice and soft and conformable. Um, it should stick down nicely and you can see even on Pete's hairy hand um, that it peels back quite easily, but it, it's not something that tends to sort of fall off because of the, the tackiness of it. So if Pete had a, um, a skin tear on the back of his hand there that was pointing down towards his fingers, when he put the dressing on, he'd be putting an arrow pointing down. So in the box, you get all sorts of things. You get a nice Sharpie pen courtesy of H&R as well so that when you've put the dressing over your hand, you've already got a pen to draw your arrow on, the date that you put the dressing on, um, and then before you've put the dressing on, um, do you all have the facility to take a photograph of something? Most people tend to do that now. So in the box as well, I don't know if you've seen any of those little ruler post-it notes. It's like a little paper ruler that's tacky on the back and you can write the patient's name on and the date. There, Pete's holding one up and sticking on his forehead. Um, and you can just uh, peel one of those off. <laughs> Put it next to the wound with the patient's name or your resident's name and the date. And then when you take your photograph, you've got that record in there. Um, so all of that is inside your box for you. Now, the supplies of the dressings, if you're unfortunate enough to have lots of skin tears and you're getting through the dressings, um, you need to ask the district nurses for more supplies. So this is just to emphasise these dressings are more expensive. This is not a substitute for a soft pour. This is a dressing specifically for your skin tears. So don't go raiding the box to stick it on any old little nick or wart or something else cut on somebody's toe. Um, these are to be saved for your skin tears, but if you need more of them, you can ask your district nurses and they can order them on their dressings ordering system for you. Um, so just, just let them know and, and they will be able to, to replace it. 